Hello, everyone. I'm HY, a host of today's seminar. And on behalf of Hong Kong Policy Research Institute, Center for the Rule of Law, I would like to welcome and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this is a, an exciting seminar that I could guarantee. Um, the topic of today's seminar is basic law. What is it and how does it work? In which tonight our speaker will talk about the history and the background of this particular document as well as its nature and importance. A fascinating topic and an important one too in understanding Hong Kong public and legal development in the recent years. Our speaker tonight is Mr. C. M. Chen, Research Fellow of the Center for the Rule of Law. He is also a distinguished pra practicing solicitor in Hong Kong, England, and Wales. <coughs> Sorry. His work has been influential in fields of law and public administration, one of the deepest thinkers of our time, and a teacher figure to me personally. So without further ado, please welcome Mr. C. M. Chen. Thank you, uh, XY, for your very generous introduction. Uh, I wouldn't actually say that claim that I'm a, one of the deepest thinker of our time, uh, but I'm here to just to share some of the observations uh, of the basic law. Um, just to begin, uh, this is a sort of like an ABC. I will start from very basic concepts of the basic law, uh, talk a, a little bit about the background, etc. So if you're looking for some uh, very um, deep argument, then perhaps this is not exactly for you. Uh, but in terms of a general introduction, I hope in the next hour or so, I can give you some uh, background and some useful information that you can take home. Next page. Um, so contents, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about five topics today, a little bit history, a uh, bit about the treaties, the three so-called unequal treaties, um, which are very important for uh, Hong Kong's uh, history. Uh, then we'll talk about the Sino-British Joint Declaration and the very concepts of one country, two systems. Then of course, uh, I'll talk about uh, the background, the uh, days leading to the um, pr promulgation of the basic law and the basic law itself. Um, I'll look at it from an international domestic and the constitutional dimensions. So a bit of history. Um, you know, for those who are familiar with Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong has been around for a long, long time. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, some historic document, Hong Kong has been, uh, was occupied by human beings more than 30,000 years ago. Some people say prehistoric time. Going back to uh, more recent histories in, term of, in terms of the uh, history of China as a whole, um, Hong Kong was uh, first mentioned, at least in Qin Dynasty, QI and Qin Dynasty, uh, more than 200 uh, years BC. So more than 2000 years ago, uh, Hong Kong was already mentioned in, uh, as part of China. So I guess my, my main point is, uh, uh, Hong Kong has a long history, but it has always been part of China. Of course, the concept of one single China uh, was relatively quite recent in the uh, few hundred years uh, 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 leading to the modern days. But in any event, Hong Kong is always part of the greater China as a concept. So as you can see from the PowerPoint, uh, Hong Kong has always been part of China um, and until the Qing dynasty, this is another dynasty different from the Qin dynasty I referred to earlier. Qing dynasty is the last dynasty of uh, the uh, uh, old China. Um, when it was uh, ceded to the British Empire in 1842, um, it was ceded because of the so-called Opium Wars. Um, and as a result of the Opium Wars, in very simple terms, uh, the British Empire then in the 19th century uh, was selling opium to China. 
uh, which was later banned by the Qing Dynasty emperor. So that resulted in some international disputes between the British Empire and the Qing Dynasty. And war broke out. And uh, the three treaties, the first one is called the Treaty of Nanjing or Nanking, different um, uh, uh, alliteration, the pronunciation is slightly different, uh, after the First Opium War. So Hong Kong Island was ceded to the British Empire. So for those who are familiar with the geographical uh, geography of Hong Kong, Hong Kong is basically made up of three parts. The Hong Kong Island, which is sort of like the capital of Hong Kong, which is, as from its name, is an island. The second part of Hong Kong is called Kowloon, which is a peninsula uh, opposite of the Hong Kong Island. And also a vast land up north adjoining China is called New Territories. So. The first treaty after the Opium War, called Treaty of Nanjing or Nanking, the Hong Kong Island was ceded to British permanently, in fact. So uh, um, <clears throat> obviously uh, China, the Qing Dynasty Emperor of China was defeated in that uh, war and British uh, claimed the whole of Hong Kong Island. The second treaty is uh, called the Convention of uh, Peking, uh, which rectify the Treaty of uh, Tianjin, which is uh, another city of China. In any event, it was uh, signed in 1860 after the Second Opium War. And the result of this particular war was the secession of Kowloon, which I mentioned earlier is the peninsula, the southern tip of uh, the peninsula opposite uh, Hong Kong Island. So further land were granted to um, uh, the, 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 the British uh, on a permanent basis. The third treaty, 1898, uh, remember the, this year is actually important, 1898, the convention to extend the Hong Kong New Territory, which I mentioned is the vast land up north adjoining China, was leased to the British, not by way of secession, it's a lease. And 1898, the lease is a 99 years term. So 99 years plus 1898 is 1997. So 1997 becomes a very important year for Hong Kong because that's the year when the lease of new territories ended. And if the lease is ended, meaning new territories will be returned to China. So 1997 marks a, a very important year. China resumed the, the exercise of sovereignty over Hong Kong. So interestingly, um, when we talk about the first and second treaties, I mentioned that uh, uh, the Hong Kong Island, the Kowloon, Kowloon Peninsula was ceded permanently. So in theory, in theory, the British, could have refused the return of Hong Kong Island and Kowloon Peninsula because legally speaking, uh, it's only obliged to return the least new territories under the third opium, uh, the third treaty. But from a practical point of view, Hong Kong is rather small. Hong Kong Island and Kowloon Peninsula, rather small. Uh, it cannot survive solely on Hong Kong Island plus the peninsula. So with the return of new territories, in effect, the British decided that the whole of Hong Kong should return to China. Otherwise, it means nothing with only Hong Kong Island as a small island with the resources. It doesn't even have uh, natural water as a, uh, resources. So in the end, 1997 marks the complete uh, resumption of uh, sovereignty by China. Um, now I want to spend a few minutes on the unequal treaties, the concept of uh, unequal treaties under international law from China's perspective. Um, earlier on, I mentioned the whole of Hong Kong was ceded or leased to the British because of the three treaties. But all along from China's point of view, these treaties are, quote, unequal, meaning what? because 
they were um, made under coercion. They were only uh, the Qing dynasty, the emperor only signed uh, with his representative, signed the unequal treaties under coercion by force. So it should not have any legal force. That's always, China's always uh, maintained this position. Um, and of course, when you look at uh, modern international law, under 50, Article 51, Article 52 of Vienna Convention of, on Law of Treaties, which was uh, signed in 1969, coerced consent shall be without legal effect. So if a sovereign state imposed power on a second uh, sovereign state by way of force, and as a result, a treaty was signed, the treaty itself should have no legal effect because it's under, signed under coercion. So this is the uh, current modern uh, international law position, which is uh, under the, uh, the, the UN Charter. So that, that's the sort of uh, the legal position between China and Britain and so far as the uh, unequal treaties is concerned. Um, before I move on to the next topic, I just want to mention that uh, I mentioned the, the significance of the year 1997. So on the one hand, China is basically saying that uh, oh, the three treaties are not um, of, uh, are of, were of no effect. But in the end, China and Great Britain still used 1997 as the year of resumption. So in a, in a sense, it's a practical approach. On the one hand, we don't recognize the free treaties, but we still use the year 1997 after the expiration of the 99 year lease as a reference point. So it's sort of like an international compromise between uh, China and Great Britain on the point of uh, resumption of sovereignty. A bit more of the historic background. Um, in the 60s, uh, there is a big international uh, debate on the future of all the colonies around the world, uh, including those in Africa, in Asia. Um, the so-called Western uh, imperial powers, including the United Kingdom, uh, Spain, France, this imperial powers, because of historic reasons, they set up colonies all around the world, mainly in Asia and Africa. Uh, so in the 60s, there's, there was a big uh, 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 debate how to deal with all these colonies going forward. Uh, one big argument is uh, these colonies should all get independence. They should all become independent countries. So in 1961, the United Nations General Assembly, uh, they established a special committee on the implement, implementation and declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples. Uh, we call it Resolution 1514. To deal with, like I said, the future of all these colonial countries, basically recognizing this colony's right to self-determination, decolonization, it gaining independence. A very important resolution was passed in 1972 at the request of China, based on this long held position of the status of Hong Kong and Macau, in fact, uh, which is also a colony, uh, was a colony of Portugal and uh, it uh, res resumed uh, sovereignty by China in 1999, two years after Hong Kong's uh, return to its motherland. In 1972, China made a request to the United Nations saying that Hong Kong and Macau were treated as unlawfully occupied by Great Britain. Following the logic I mentioned earlier that because the three treaties were unequal treaties, should have no effect. So all along China maintains very consistently, maintain its position. Those treaties should have no legal effect. So Hong Kong, Macau should not be considered uh, under 
uh, the uh, 1514 UN resolution. They should, Hong Kong and Macau should have no right to be granted the status of independence or self-determination. And the UN agreed. So the UN General Assembly passed a resolution in 1972, UN Resolution 2908, removing Hong Kong and Macau from the list of non-self-governing territories. And that's actually lead, led to the bad, the, the, the uh, resumption of sovereignty later on in 1997 and 1999 for Hong Kong and Macau respectively. Next page. So what follows after uh, the uh, 1972 event is in 1982, China's constitution was amended to include a new article 31, which sets as follows. The state China may establish special administrative regions, uh, acronym SAR, when necessary. The systems to be instituted in special administrative regions, SAR, shall be prescribed by law enacted by the National People's Congress of the People's Republic of China in the light of specific conditions. It's quite wordy. What it means is, when it was amended in 1982, the uh, China's constitution, people was scratching their head. You know, what, what does it mean? What's the purpose of Article 31? It's actually led to, it paved way, ways for Hong Kong and in fact, Taiwan in the longer run to be returned to China under a very special arrangement, Article 31, i.e. Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau in the longer run when they return to China, they will be under a special administrative regions with its own spe uh, specific set of rules, unlike mainland China, which, which we all know exercise a socialist system of law. So Article 31 paves way, allow a legal framework for one country, two systems. Um, I should also mention here about a little bit about uh, China's constitution. China is a unitary state, as, so, as opposed to other uh, political system around the world. For example, the US is a federal country, a federal state with different federal states joining to form the United States of America, for example. Unlike the United Kingdom as well, United Kingdom as from its name, it has different parts of uh, Great Britain with England, Wales, I, uh, Northern Ireland, and some of its uh, foreign uh, overseas colonies. That's together, it's called United Kingdom. How, on the other hand, China adopts a unitary system, which means that the whole country one set of law, one set of system applicable to the whole China, whole of China, even though it's a vast country, with the exception of Article 31. So you know, you can now see that Article 31 is such a significant article and allows a unitary country, China, to set up special administrative regions, SAR, uh, for the time being only two, Hong Kong and Macau, and in the longer run, Taiwan as well, for the purpose of reunification. Next page. Um, can you can you close the box? I can't see the slide. There's a box there blocking the slide. Um, the concept of the uh, uh, one country, two systems, like, like I said, was uh, derived from Article Thirty One. But leading up to the negotiations to the joint declaration, um, since 1982, it took a long time for the uh, British, British government and the Chinese government to negotiate uh, a treaty, a joint declaration on the future of Hong Kong. They started in 1982, uh, soon after the then uh, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher visited Beijing uh, and uh, had a uh, discussion with the uh, Chinese uh, senior leader, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, at that time. 
It started off in 1982. And in, the, in 1983, the principles of one country, two systems were agreed. And then 1984, Sino-British Joint Declaration was signed. And like I said, 1997, Hong Kong was, quote, handed over back to the United Kingdom. But uh, from China's point of view, it's a resumption of the exercise of sovereignty because of the unequal treaty, all the concepts I mentioned before. Um, next page. So uh, talk a little bit more about the negotiations. Uh, it's not easy, um, as you can imagine. Uh, it's an international treaty, it's an international negotiation between China and Britain, two sovereign states. Um, in the end, um, they've agreed that uh, the, the joint declaration sets out some very basic principles, uh, the, the, the concept of one country, two systems, uh, meaning the socialist system and policies shall not practice in Hong Kong, in the Hong Kong SAR. Um, Hong Kong's previous capitalist system, legal system, judicial system, lifestyle, rights obligations shall remain unchanged for 50 years from 1997, meaning until 2047, uh, provided, of course, that they don't contravene the, the provisions of the basic law. So the joint declaration sets out these basic policies in the basic law. There are 12 of them, 12 basic policies. So the beauty of the joint declaration is it provides a solution for Hong Kong, uh, a peaceful manner whereby a sovereignty of, the, of Hong Kong, colonial Hong Kong was passed back to China in 1997 with a lot of uh, safeguards, with lo a lot of guarantees uh, to uh, retain Hong Kong as an important international trade center. And also some of the basic human rights were also safeguarded under the joint declaration. I mentioned 12 basic policies. Uh, they cover political system, economic system, judicial system, etc. So let's take a look at these uh, 12 policies. First one, upholding national unity because uh, China always consider Hong Kong as part of China. So it's a return of sovereignty, resumption of sovereignty. So national unity, territorial integrity, but taking into account the special history of Hong Kong and realities. Hong Kong's, like I said, always a very capitalistic uh, city. Um, and China, on the other hand, exercise a socialist system of law. So Article 31, I mentioned earlier, allows that to happen. Second policy, Hong Kong will be directly under the authority of the uh, Central People's Republic of China's central government's control. It's under its authority. However, this is important, Hong Kong enjoys a high degree of autonomy, except in foreign and defense affairs, which are the responsibilities of the central government. So high degree of autonomy, important. Third policy, Hong Kong will be vested with its own executive, legislative, and independent judicial power, the three branches of government. Importantly, importantly for the judicial power, Hong Kong will have its own power of final adjudication, which uh, I will talk a little bit more tomorrow. So it's a... Uh, um, just to lure you to uh, come back tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit more about the court system in Hong Kong tomorrow. So all the laws previously enforced in Hong Kong before 1997 will remain unchanged. Next page. Um, next policy, Hong Kong will be composed of local inhabitants, the Hong Kong chief executive, which is our head, the head of the Hong Kong's government, uh, we call it chief executive, it will be appointed by the central government with, as a result of uh, elections, 
or consultations. Again, this is important. The way we choose our uh, Hong Kong's chief executive, we'll spend a bit more time tomorrow. But more importantly, the basic concept behind this policy four is Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, governing Hong Kong. Policy five, the current, meaning before pre-1997, social economic systems in Hong Kong will remain unchanged, meaning all the rights, freedoms, including those of freedom of speech, freedom of press, assembly, association, travel, movement, strike, choice of occupation, research, academic, religious belief, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these human rights will continue to be enjoyed by Hong Kong residents. And of course, private property ownership, legitimate rights, inheritance, foreign investments will always protected by law. Next page. The policy six, Hong Kong will retain its status as a free port separate customs, different from the, separate from mainland China. For example, Hong Kong, it's an uh, um, it, uh, independent member under the WTO, World Trade Organization, alongside China. So uh, even though Hong Kong is not a sovereign country, but it enjoys certain status in the international community. Again, I'll spend a bit more uh, time on this tomorrow. Um, Policy seven, Hong Kong will retain its status as an international financial center, markets for foreign exchange, gold, et cetera, et cetera. Free flow of capital, this is important. Hong Kong dollar will continue to be circulated and remain freely convertible, uh, like today. Hong Kong dollar is separate from mainland China, China uh, which is, has its own national currency called renminbi. Hong Kong dollar is the official currency of Hong Kong itself. Um, policy nine, Hong Kong will have independent uh, finances, meaning that uh, Hong, the central government, China, will not levy taxes on Hong, Hong Kong. So Hong Kong citizens, they pay taxes, but only to Hong Kong government. The Hong Kong government will have its own budget, doesn't uh, mix with the central government's budget. Policy nine, Hong Kong uh, may establish mutually beneficial economic relations with United Kingdom and other countries. This is actually what I mentioned, Hong Kong still, even nowadays, have some independent uh, international relations with the authorization by the central government. We have certain, to a certain extent, uh, international role to play. I mentioned about the WTO. Uh, another example is Hong Kong has its own sports team to participate um, in the Olympics, for example. In the World Cup, Hong Kong has its own team. And in, at times, Hong Kong national football teams actually play against China's uh, national football team in the World Cup qualifying games. So this is very, very special under this uh, one country, two systems. Next policy, 10. Um, Hong Kong can use its name, Hong Kong, China, in international uh, organizations, agreements, participation I mentioned earlier. Hong Kong even have its own travel documents. So I being a Hong Kong residents, I have my own passport. It's called a Hong Kong SAR passport. Of course, it's a, it, it, it is a valid international passport. Uh, unlike those issued by the central people's government to uh, mainland uh, Chinese uh, citizens, uh, we have different passports, even though uh, the Hong Kong SAR passport is, of course, it's also a Chinese passport. Uh, policy 11, the maintenance of public order shall be responsible of Hong Kong government. So we have our own Hong Kong police uh, to um, maintain law and order in Hong Kong. Policy 12, the last one, um, these policies uh, regarding Hong Kong um, is actually stipulated in the joint declaration and under the joint declaration, it was, remember this joint declaration was uh, signed in 1984. Uh, it was anticipated that a basic law of Hong Kong will be enacted and providing all the protections and constitutional framework in the document called the basic law. 
It was contemplated in 1984, and it was finally, the basic law was uh, promulgated in 1990, which we'll come to this in a minute. So these are the 12 policies under the joint declaration signed by Great Britain and China, um, China. in 1984. Um, and this joint declaration was actually registered with the United Nations as an international treaty, as an international document in the UN, next page. So basic law, like I said before, the 12 policies regarding Hong Kong were enshrined in the basic law, which is the constitutional document for Hong Kong. Um, the Hong Kong uh, arrangement, all these basic policies will remain unchanged for 50 years uh, from 1997. So 2047 is sort of like a deadline um, for, 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 uh, for, for these policies. Uh, there's a picture here with Margaret Thatcher and uh, senior uh, leader, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, um, uh, back in 19... Uh, 84 when they uh, 82 when the uh, when they started the negotiation uh, on the John Declaration. Going back a little bit, uh, next page. Uh, going back a little bit about I talk about Article 31 of the uh, um, uh, the Constitution of uh, the Hong Kong, which forms the basis uh, of the Hong Kong SAR. I should also mention that Article 62. Bracket 13 of the Constitution of China says, says that to decide the establishment of the SAR and the systems to be instituted there. This is important in the sense that under Article 62, China always has the power to set up systems to be implemented in Hong Kong. Um, the importance of this is the recent debate about the national security law in Hong Kong. Uh, you may have heard about this, which was enacted uh, in 2020 by the central government, which are now annexed to the basic law and applicable in Hong Kong. So I'm, I'm sowing the seed here about Article 62. We don't have time to cover this today, but hopefully tomorrow I have some time to talk about it uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, next page. So, like I said, the basic law was promulgated in 1990. It was adopted by the National People's Congress uh, at its uh, third session of the seventh uh, National People's Congress. Like I said, under Article 31 of the Constitution, Hong Kong SAR, Special Administrative Region, was established in 1997. Next page. Um, talk a little bit more about the drafting and the uh, uh, and the contents of the basic law. Uh, it started in 1985. Remember, the Sino-British Joint Declaration was signed in 1984. So it, one year later, um, there was a committee form. It's called Basic Law Drafting Committee was established um, to look into what should be included in the in the basic law, uh, the, the, the constitutional document for Hong Kong. Um, as I recall, there were something like 59 members of this uh, basic law drafting committee uh, made, made up of uh, members from mainland China, mainly government officials from China, and also uh, some Hong Kong representatives uh, in this basic law com drafting committee. At the same time, a basic law consultative committee was also formed to canvas views uh, from Hong Kong, uh, as Hong Kong citizens and different uh, bodies. The number of drafts and the final draft was uh, produced in 1990 and was promulgated by the uh, uh, National People's Congress, like as I explained. Before 1997, Hong Kong did have some sort of constitutional documents uh, two, two documents, basically, called Lattice Patent and Royal Instructions, and they are documents uh, issued by the uh, United Kingdom Privy Council, the House of Lords. And these are documents that uh, 
uh, forms the backbone of pre-1997 Hong Kong government. It is important to note that these documents are uh, uh, proclaimed by the UK Privy Council without any participation of Hong Kong's citizens either. Um, of course, Hong, uh, the U UK played no role in the drafting of the Basic Law because Basic Law is, like I said, is a document promulgated by the China's niche National Congress. So after the Sino-British uh, Joint Declaration, uh, the British did not participate in the drafting of the Basic Law. However, the Basic 12 policies was always enshrined in the Basic Law. The Basic Law has uh, nine chapters, 160 articles, and three annexes. There are a number of important cases by the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal, uh, which I mentioned earlier, under the Basic Law, Hong Kong has its own Court of Final Adjudication. Before 1997, all the cases in Hong Kong, the final places for appeal actually rested with the Privy Council of the uh, United Kingdom House of Lords. So as you could imagine, the colonial days, uh, the UK Privy Council maintained uh, certain final uh, adjudication power. Since 1997, Hong Kong has its own final court of appeal. Very importantly, that it, uh, the cases, Hong Kong cases, do not actually go to uh, China courts. Hong Kong has its own um, court to decide these matters. Um, it's called Court of Final Appeal. Um, it, there are two. There are two cases here I, I specifically mentioned, uh, decided by the uh, Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal after the uh, after 1997. The first case is called Ng Ka Ling uh, versus Director of Immigration. We'll talk a bit uh, about this case more tomorrow. But the important decision is here. The basic law is a national law and is the constitution of the region. The, the, the importance of this sentence is, it spells out that the basic law is the most important constitutional document to Hong Kong. What this case does not say that there's only one constitution in China, which is the China's uh, constitution, uh, enacted the version of 1982. That's the only uh, constitution for the whole of China. Uh, like I said before, Hong China is a unitary state. Basic law in Hong Kong is only a constitutional document for Hong Kong, okay? The second case is called uh, Hong Kong SAR versus Ma Y. Quan David in 1997. It said, uh, it, the, the, the judgment said, that the basic law is a unique document. It reflects a treaty made between two nations. It deals with the relationship between the sovereign and an autonomous region, Hong Kong, which practices a different system. It stipulates the net organizations and functions of different branches of government. It sets out the rights and obligations of the citizens. Hence, it has at least three dimensions, international, domestic, and constitutional. Next page. Um, first of all, the international dimension. Of course, we met, we've been talking in the past uh, half an hour that uh, the uh, Sino-British Joint Declaration is the international dimension of it. It's an international treaty. Of course, it's an international element that. Um, it is a... Uh, from an international perspective, it is uh, important that uh, from China's perspective, uh, it is an international di dimension because it's an international treaty, but it's no longer relevant. Because why? Because all the provisions under the Joint Declaration have been fully implemented. And the, de the Joint Declaration has become a non-binding historical document at least from the point of view of the Chinese, uh, China's, uh, Chinese government. The domestic dimension of it, of course, um, is all, always uh, set out in the basic law because it set out the relationship between the central authorities and Hong Kong SAR. 
It set out the framework and rules and prescribed the executive power structure within one country, two systems. I cite uh, an important article of the basic law here, Article 12. Hong Kong shall be a local administrative region of China. And Hong Kong shall enjoy a high degree of autonomy, come, which comes under directly under the central people's uh, government. Article 13 of the Basic Law, central people's government shall be responsible for Hong Kong's foreign affairs. Hong Kong is not um, a sovereign country, independent country. That's why all the foreign affairs rests with the central people's uh, government. Of course, with uh, the central government's uh, authorization, Hong Kong does have some international role to play. I mentioned earlier in sports, in culture, things like that, in trade, for example, in WTO. Article 14, the central government res is responsible for Hong Kong's defense. Hong Kong doesn't have its own army. Hong Kong has its own police force to maintain law and order, but Hong Kong does not have an uh, army for its defense, which is the responsibility of the central government. Article 15, central government shall appoint the chief executive. This is important, which I'll talk more, more to, tomorrow. Being a SAR special administrative region, the chief executive is elected through a special procedure in Hong Kong, but ultimately it is appointed by the central government. Article 20, um, uh, the powers enjoyed by Hong Kong is always granted by the China's uh, National People's Congress or its standing committee. Article 22, important provision as well, the central government or uh, any department of the central government or provincial government, um, they may uh, under the central may interfere in the affairs. I think it may not interfere. I think it's, uh, there's a, a, a word missing here. The, 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 the essence of this uh, article means that the central government, oh, no, sorry, it is a negative way. Sorry, I beg your pardon. It, it says out in a negative way. No central government or provincial government may interfere in Hong Kong. It makes sense because, because of the high degree of autonomy. Hong Kong is Hong Kong. It governs its own affairs, except defense and foreign affairs and certain matters that Hong Kong does not have, have autonomy. Then, that, and that's why the central government will not interfere with Hong Kong's affairs. Um, the third dimension of the basic law is the constitutional dimension. Um, I mentioned a number of times that the basic law is a constitutional document. It's not the constitution itself because China has this, a unitary state has a constitution for the whole of China, including Hong Kong and Macau. So the basic law in so far as Hong Kong is concerned is a constitutional document and all the rights obligations of the citizens are set out here. It's a quasi constitution, but it's not a constitution. It's a constitutional document which protects the freedoms of Hong Kong citizens and the structure of the uh, executive, legislative and judicial branches of Hong Kong. Um, next page. To sum up what I've been talking uh, in the past 45 minutes or so, the basic law is a constitutional document, which I've uh, repeatedly emphasized, that sets out the principles of one country, two systems. The basic law repeats the 12 basic principles, uh, the basic policies of China regarding Hong Kong. And these 12 basic principles were set out in the joint declaration between Britain and China. And I mentioned that the joint declaration is a historic document registered with the United Nations as an international treaty. 
I also want to emphasize that the PRC, the China, China's constitution provides the basic law because it's the mother law is the constitution, where, whereas the basic law is a national law passed by the National People's Congress, which set out the constitutional framework for Hong Kong. This, are, this is the constitutional relationship between China's constitution and the basic law. And finally, uh, I reiterate, when you look at the basic law, you should look at it from three different dimensions. The international aspects of it, which is, which, which is uh, uh, to do with the joint declaration, the treaty between Britain and China, that's the international aspects. And of course, under the basic law, Hong Kong does have some international role to play with the authorization of the central government. I mentioned that Hong Kong still participates in international treaties, in international organizations with the permission of the um, central government. So these, these are the international dimension of, uh, uh, of the basic law. The, the domestic dimension is also very important. It's basically set out the constitutional framework of Hong Kong, of the Hong Kong government, the legislative, the executive and judicial branch of the Hong Kong government. Um, and also the constitutional relationship between the central government and Hong Kong. So, so, so I hope I, I've, um, in uh, sort of 45 minutes, I sort of uh, gave you an overview of how basic law has come about, its important provisions, the basic policies in Hong Kong, the concept of one country, two systems, Hong Kong people governing Hong Kong, or the so-called high degree of autonomy, how it works. Um, I, 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 I know that it's uh, a lot of information for 45 minutes, um, but these are the uh, essence of the basic law. And it's so important to remind ourselves of these basic policies when you look at Hong Kong's problem today, or Hong Kong's uh, as a whole today, why are we here, and all these uh, in interesting dimensions. with the background of why basic law was implemented. And with that note, I hope uh, you find the speech useful. Um, I now turn back uh, the mic to the uh, MC, uh, Mr. Yu. Once again, thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you CM for the exceptional uh, presentation. Uh, well, uh, we have entered into um, the Q&A session. So um, yes, uh, registrants and participants, you're welcome to uh, leave your questions, or if any comments um, in the Q&A uh, yeah, section of this Zoom. Uh, let me know. Yeah. I'm always a uh, welcome uh, debate. Um, make it more interactive, um, this session. Um, instead of me talking one way, uh, I always welcome uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, or even a debate. You may disagree with some of the things I said. Uh, I welcome that as well. Any? Question? Oh, we, oh, we actually received a question now. Sorry, a bit of technical Some echo here. Yeah. Um, well, much better now. Yes. Um, there's a question for CM regarding uh, the mini constitution um, name or 
the basic law. So uh, what do you reckon on this uh, particular name um, or this nation? Well, some might call um, the basic law as the mini constitution of Hong Kong. So um, yeah, CM, what do you think about it? Um, yeah, it's a very good question. In fact, um, uh, I, I, I talked about 45 minutes about what basic law is all about. It sets out all the uh, framework for Hong Kong's government, um, how Hong Kong should um, govern itself. So in all, from all angles, when one look at the definition of a constitution, um, I'm not going to lecture you on uh, uh, what's the definition of a constitution, but there, there, there are one or two characteristics of a constitution uh, or constitutional law. Uh, the, the most important one is a constitution is law, of course, it's a, it's a national law. In any country, one important aspect of it is it must be different from its other ordinary laws. Okay? Constitution law, constitution itself, must be different or higher than normal laws, ordinary laws. I, I think that, that this is a, a acceptable um, definition. When I talk about higher, what, what I meant was entrenched. This is actually the word uh, people like to use. Entrenched, a constitution is always entrenched, meaning it cannot be easily changed like other ordinary laws, okay? In, I'm not talking about Hong Kong or China or any specific countries, I'm talking uh, things in general. A country, a parliament, a congress can always pass new laws, okay? A law replacing old laws, new laws replacing old laws. This is a normal function of a congress of a parliament. So, um, from that angle, one can say that, oh, how about a constitution? Can you change a constitution? Yes, of course you can. But there is always an element of entrenchment, meaning a constitutional can be changed, but the threshold of having it change must be higher than ordinary laws. That's a common understanding of uh, constitutional experts. So looking at from this angle, the basic law can be changed. Again, we'll talk about the way how the basic law can be changed tomorrow. Uh, but it's not like any other ordinary legislation. There is a special procedure before the basic law can be changed. In essence, there are basically three uh, steps. The Hong Kong Legislative Council, uh, should approve it with a two third majority. The Hong Kong government should approve it. And also the central government through its uh, National People's Congress should approve it. So there's a special procedure which does not like any other laws in Hong Kong. Other laws, Hong Kong Legislative Council, which is the uh, legislative body of Hong Kong can make laws on its own volition. It can make laws by simple majority. New laws covering replacing old laws. It can always do that, but not the basic law. So from that angle, there's an element of entrenchment there. But let me reiterate, basic law is not a mini, mini constitution. It's a not a mini constitution for Hong Kong because there, there is only one constitution for China as a unitary state. The uh, People's Republic of China Constitution 1982. That's the only constitution. And like I said, the whole of Hong Kong SAR was established under Article 31 of China's constitution. So my answer, uh, sorry, it's a long-winded answer, but simple answer to that particular question, basic law is not a mini constitution of Hong Kong. It is a constitutional document with a lot of characteristics of a constitution, but it is a national law of China. Basic law is a national law of China. It has constitutional um, nature for Hong Kong 
as they are, is my answer to it. Any other so, question? Yes, uh, actually, there's a question, uh, yes, from one of our attendees. So uh, the question is, is NSL a breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration? Well, actually, this is also uh, one of my questions I would like to raise. Yeah. Um, so, Sam, do you think that uh, the national security law or it's the Sino-British Joint Declaration um, really fundamentally breached um, through some uh, national acts or some uh, laws that uh, I think this is actually um, an opinion or some sort of allegation uh, posed by uh, some foreign uh, politicians or some sort of, uh, say, comments from outside of Hong Kong. So yeah, what do you make of it? Uh it's a very topical question. I think echo is a, it's a loud echo. Maybe, yeah. Um, a very, very uh, topical question. Um, NSL, for those who are not familiar with the acronym, is the National Security Law for Hong Kong. Uh, it was uh, enacted by the National People's Congress uh, Standing Committee uh, in uh, 2020. Um, and then it was annexed to the basic law. Um, uh, I didn't uh, elaborate uh, the mechanism of Annex 3, but in uh, simple terms, simple terms, um, national law of China do not apply in Hong Kong in simple terms. The national law in China does not apply in Hong Kong because basic law set out already very comprehensive framework for how Hong Kong uh, should work. Except, except there's a mechanism allowing certain national laws to be applicable in Hong Kong via Annex 3. So there's a mechanism for the National People's Congress of China to include certain important national provisions in the basic law so that it becomes applicable in Hong Kong. One example is national flag. China's national flag and emblem. It's, uh, it was annexed in Annex 3 of the basic law, so that it becomes part of Hong Kong's law. For the law, for the national law to be annexed in the basic law, Hong Kong has two options. Number one, after the annexation of a national law in the basic law, Hong Kong can still pass a local domestic law to implement that national law of China. The national uh, uh, emblem and national flag law is one of the example. China has its own national flag and uh, uh, the, uh, emblem law. It was annexed in the basic law so that it becomes applicable in Hong Kong. Hong Kong then through its own legislative council passed a local Hong Kong law to put this national law into effect so that the national anthem is also applicable in Hong Kong. The, uh, sorry, a national emblem and national flag. National anthem is a separate matter, which incidentally was also annexed to Hong Kong two years ago, but that's a separate topic, which I'm not going to touch on to, to, to tonight. Anyway, so there's a mechanism for national law, China's national law, to be included in Hong Kong. Another example is the, uh, uh, the garrison law. The China's army, the People's Liberation Army, they do have a presence in Hong Kong. Uh, there's a national law uh, governing uh, the uh, garrison of uh, the Chinese army in Hong Kong. That was also a national law which was, which was annexed to Annex 3 of the basic law becomes applicable in Hong Kong. That's another example. So what I've just uh, described in the past five minutes is there's a mechanism for national law to be 
become applicable in Hong Kong. Going back to this particular question, when China, when National People's Congress Standing Committee in 2020 passed a Hong Kong version national security law and then becomes applicable in Hong Kong, some international commentary saying that, oh, that's the end of one country, two systems, because China is now enacting law on Hong Kong's behalf. Beijing is now putting their hands in Hong Kong. So that's a breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Uh, that's the end of one country, two systems. That's the end of Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy. I disagree. I disagree with this international commentaries. The simple reason, when you look at the basic law, it always provides a mechanism. This is the basic law, by the way. <laughs> I'm holding one in my hand. It always provides a mechanism for national law, which are not within the power of Hong Kong, including those of foreign affairs, national defense, and other issues that outside of Hong Kong's autonomy. The joint declaration to a certain extent, and also the basic law when they were implemented, when they were signed, when they were promulgated, it was always contemplated that there might be instances that uh, national law can be included in Hong Kong via Annex 3. So from that angle, I disagree that NSL, National Security Law, um, passed by uh, NPCSC, National People's Congress Standing Committee last year, is a breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Like I said, the reason is simple. It's that always the intention that in some circumstances, national law will be applicable in Hong Kong. And there's a mechanism in the basic law to provide that uh, mechanism. That, sorry, again, uh, that's a long-winded answer. I hope uh, that's uh, helpful to the audience. Let me pass the mic back to MC. Yes, thank you, Zian. Uh, we actually have another question from, sorry, for the echo. Maybe uh, turn my mic off, uh, unmute me, and then you can speak. Is it better now? No, very not. Okay, great. Um, so one of our attendees uh, asked, um, CM, do you think basic law can be, um, I guess, go on forever? Yes. Um, the, because the question here will be, Wang Zhou. Yeah, do you think? Uh, I, I, I think the cross of this question will be, uh, what do you think uh, when we talk about the future of basic law after um, the 2047? Uh, yes, I, I think the question will be, um, beyond uh, 2047, what would basic law be? Yes, what's the future for basic law? when um, it comes to um, the 50 years of uh, not changing of the Hong Kong uh, structure and fundamentals. Yes. Could basic law be um, continued forever? Question, again, this is a very topical question, uh, often asked by um, my friends, my international friends. Um, before I answer this question, I should uh, actually at the outset uh, make this disclaimer. Um, everything I said tonight, of course, is my own personal opinion. I do not represent anyone here and I do not represent any uh, 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 body. Um, it's my personal views. And uh, that's why I said uh, before the Q&A, I welcome debates, I welcome comments. Uh, I might be wrong. <laughs> um, so my personal view is uh, what happens after 2047. Uh, remember I mentioned at the outset there are a number of important dates. The first one being 1898, uh, when the third unequal treaty was signed. 
Uh, and when the, the new territories part of Hong Kong was leased to Britain, 1898, and the lease was 99 years. So in the next key date, key date was 1997, <laughs> when this unequal, uh, the, the, the lease term, the, so to speak, the lease term uh, was expired in 1997. And when 1997, the basic law, Begin, began to be enforced, there was a promise of 50 years. So 50 years from 1997 is 2047. The question is whether the basic law can continue to be operational or to be effective after 2047. The simple answer is, I don't know, <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. Um, but the important point to be noted from a legal point of view, there is a expiry date, correct, in the basic law, 50 years, from 1997 till 2047. My personal view is, Hong Kong is an important international trading center, finance center. The unique arrangement under the basic law, i.e. Hong Kong's uh, unique legal system, judicial system, executive system, uh, one country, two systems, benefit Hong Kong, not only Hong Kong. In fact, it benefits China in many ways. Um, Hong Kong's uh, special role um, in China, even before 1997, was obvious. Hong Kong being a buffer zone for China, it can act as a sort of uh, intermediaries. Uh, we saw that during the Korean Wars um, in the 50s, um, when international imposed embargo on China, Hong Kong actually acted as a very important conduit to provide important resources for China to connect with the international community. community. Hong Kong continues to play this important uh, role after 1997 until today. Um, I mentioned earlier that Hong Kong has a, its own currency, Hong Kong dollars, whereas China adopts renminbi as national currencies. Hong Kong dollars is now packed at a fixed exchange rate with the US dollars. This is very important from the sense that China can, through Hong Kong, get some of its uh, foreign exchange. Um, this is uh, evidenced by the fact that many of the Chinese enterprises they are listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange nowadays in Hong Kong. They raised capital through Hong Kong dollars, which is a freely convertible currency. Uh, this is an important aspect, just one of the important aspects. Currency, information, um, and also via Hong Kong's unique legal system, because of its historic connection, uh, with the UK, Hong Kong is the only city in the whole of China that practices common law. Hong Kong maintains its common law tradition. So with this, Hong Kong plays and continue, will continue to play an important role to link China and the rest of the world. Um, I'm a lawyer, I'm a practicing lawyer, so that's why I particularly feel the importance of maintaining Hong Kong's unique common law tradition. The Hong Kong government, and in fact, the central government, have been saying that Hong Kong should become an international hub for the region, for the world. One example is Hong Kong should aim to become an international dispute resolution center. You may have heard that there are a number of initiatives 
set out by the central government. For example, the Belt and Road Initiatives, uh, which was uh, uh, proposed by the central government a few years ago. Um, the Belt and Road, the Silk Road and the Maritime Silk Road, meaning China wants to connect all these uh, international countries by way of a Silk Road for trade, development, for people, freedom, movement, uh, for exchanges culturally. Hong Kong has a role to play because Hong Kong is such an international city. And when I mentioned the unique legal system in Hong Kong being the common law tradition, Hong Kong can always play a role as a dispute resolution center. Take for example, a barrel of rural country, let's say Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is now signing a contract with the Chinese enterprises. In all these foreign international investment contract, there's always a dispute resolution clause. When there is a dispute about their contractual claims, how do you do it? You must seek an independent body to resolve the disputes. Hong Kong can actually play an important role. Hong Kong, because of its common law tradition, can become a center for dispute resolution for Chinese enterprises and other uh, international enterprises. Because Hong Kong, like I said, is the only common law city in the whole of China. And that's important. That's a great contribution for China's uh, integration in the world and also for our Hong Kong ourselves. We can also make use of our position to further develop our industry, our dispute resolution industry. Another example is Hong Kong as a regional headquarters for inbound investments and outbound investments for China. International companies, they might want to go into China to invest, to set up factories, for example, uh, cell phones, you know, famous brand of cell phones. They might want to set up factories in China because of the cheaper labors, more effective labor in China, and then ex export to other countries for sales. So the international companies are always looking for opportunities in China. So we call it inbound investments. I always said that Hong Kong can play a role for all these inbound investments. You set up a Hong Kong company and using the Hong Kong company to do business in China. When there is a problem, utilize Hong Kong legal system, Hong Kong common law tradition to resolve your disputes with Chinese um, parties. On the other hand, outbound investments, especially in recent years, more and more Chinese companies seek to invest in other countries internationally. I always said that Hong Kong can also play a role, play a sort of a superconductor role. You know, uh, our former chief executive likes to put it as a superconductor. Hong Kong companies, Hong Kong legal services, Hong Kong surf service industries, including accountant, engineer, they can play a role. When China enterprises want to go out, they can come to Hong Kong first, set up a Hong Kong company, use that Hong Kong company as the contract signing entity with international parties. Again, when there is a dispute, come back to Hong Kong for dispute resolution. Utilizing Hong Kong unique um, system and talents. I mentioned two examples. One is the trade finance role that Hong Kong play, the currency, international free flow of information, and also the legal or unique common law tradition. These two aspects benefit not, not only Hong Kong citizens. In my view, it also benefits China as a whole, in terms of its holistically, its, its development in the past 20, 30 years. Again, I gave you a very long-winded answer. Do, what do I think about uh, after 2047? My answer is, legally speaking, 
there is an expiry date of 50 years. However, if Hong Kong continues to be useful to China, I see no reason why Hong Kong existing systems should be changed after 2047. If Hong Kong performs well, continues to be an important service center for China, I am optimistic that even beyond 2047, Hong Kong can still retain its special status as a special administrative region. Then again, it's my personal view. People may disagree with me, especially some commentaries said that uh, after 2019, as you may know that there was a massive protest in Hong Kong, and in some ways, destabilizing the Hong Kong structure, and maybe even China as a whole, affecting China as a whole, uh, in terms of its uh, national unity. If Hong Kong is not a useful city for China, then perhaps some people may argue that 2047, there, there is no need to continue with the concept of one country, two systems. If Hong Kong becomes a threat, let me put it more bluntly, to China. Personally, I'm a more optimistic person. And I repeat, if Hong Kong continues to be useful to China, I'm optimistic that uh, Hong Kong can remain a special status after 2047. Sorry, again, I give you a very long-winded answer to a simple question, but nothing is simple nowadays in Hong Kong. It is a simple, but also a very important question. Sorry, sorry for the echo again. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, yes, sorry. Um, with that, I think that shall also conclude today's seminar. And also thank you, Sam, for the comprehensive presentation and the answers to um, the questions. Um, so, yeah, tomorrow we will be uh, having uh, our second uh, seminar on basic law, uh, in which we shall uh, focus on um, the basic law and its uh, relations um, between uh, Hong Kong's political, economic, and legal structure. Um, so yeah, uh, I will see, hopefully we will see you tomorrow. And thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. Um, good night. Thank you.